A lot of people don't realize that Tolkien was involved in this. He was only involved for about three days, but it was three days that must have affected him very deeply. He was a huge skeptic of machinery. He realized that all he was doing was participating in the advance of the machine. If we're not careful, we're going to be devoured by the beast. And I believe it is the biblical beast. AI will become the biblical beast that owns us and only Christ will be able to defeat it. But he gives us the solution and the solution is that we have to become saints because ultimately the machine cannot deal with saints. There's a very interesting book out. It's called Mount Doom, the prophecy of Tolkien revealed. Paul List, one of the authors of that book, is going to be on the program at 30 past the hour. Did Tolkien predict artificial intelligence? Let's talk about the rise of machine language, machine learning, machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, false reality, and the connection between that, pornography, and the death of scholasticism. By the way, my name is Joe McLean. I host a radio program called A Catholic Take, where we look at the world through a Catholic lens. I'd love for you to hang out with us. If you like it, give it a thumbs up and let us know what you think in the comments below. I got a hold of this book. Paul List is one of the co-authors of the book, The Prophecy of Tolkien Revealed. You have a quote right on the last page of your book that I thought was uh, apropos for, for conversating today about, um, about this very interesting topic. Did the rise of artificial intelligence, the rise of uh, of of pornography being leveled as like a weapon of war against humanity. And then you quote Alexander Solzhenitsyn, you say, once wrote in his book, Gulag Archipelago, the line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart. And through all human hearts, this line shifts inside us. It oscillates with the years. And even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small uh, bridgehead of good is retained. I thought that was a great quote, and I thought it's a good place to begin in your book. So yeah. it's your interpretation seems to be uh, about the war within each and every one of us, looking at Tolkien's work. I think it's fair, but I really want to get into Tolkien. I, like, I did not, I honestly, I did not know that Tolkien had participated in, uh, in the British government's effort, secret project to to crack the Enigma code of the Nazi party and, and create this machine that could not only, you know, interpret what the Nazis were trying to communicate through the Enigma device, but anticipate to think almost. Tell me about that time in Tolkien's life. Well, he had just published The Hobbit and it was very successful. He was the world's leading philologist, which is the, uh, the study of languages. Um, he spoke like 12 languages. Uh, so they recruited him as a uh, top secret group of the Dons of Oxford, Cambridge, and whatnot um, to crack the Enigma Code. Um, the Enigma Code was really, uh, what it was, was um, a machine that, that ciphered uh, the German language and then deciphered it on the other end. So the mach there had to be two machines involved, and they had to be set up the same way. But there were literally millions upon millions of ways that this machine could be set up. And... So it wasn't about interpreting what the machine was saying or anything. It was really about figuring out how the machine was set up so we could set up the one that was captured the same way. But by the time he figured out how to set it up, they'd already changed to a different setting. They changed the setting sometimes a couple of times a day. And um, <clears throat> so it was very difficult. So it became very uh, critical that they were able to figure out how the machine was set up very quickly. And with Alan Turing, and it's all about mathematics and statistics, and they created a machine, uh, the beginnings of uh, the modern computer, basically, which has a fairly long history, um, to, to crack the, how the machine was set up, and, and they did, and it, and it brought about the end of the war. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Tolkien was involved in this. He was only involved for about three days. But it was three days that must have affected him very deeply. He was a huge skeptic of machinery. And when he saw that all they were gonna do with this, uh, this team that he was with was to figure out, to build a, a machine that was gonna be more powerful than the Enigma machine. And there were some other machines that the, that the Nazis had in coding that were even more powerful. Um, he realized that all he was doing was participating in the advance of the machine. That was going to, you know, get, that was going to advance in the theater of war where machines do best, and it was just bringing about uh, the rise of the machine to eventually dominate the human being. 
that's mm. exactly where we are. The first thing about the first thing that AI replaced or artificial intelligence replaced was the computer itself, believe it or not, because up until about the 1960s or so, when people referred to a computer, they referred to a human being. Uh, it would be a human being with a piece of paper and pencil and a slide rule and would be figuring out, uh, it might be um, the trajectory of a of a artillery shell or how many pounds of um, uh, fertilizer would go per acre depending on the soil samples that came back. These are things that needed to be figured out. And of course, when you're in war and you need to figure out windage and range and everything else, it would be to figure that out really fast before your enemy could. So, you know, um, the computer replaced the uh, replaced the human being, which was a computer, and obviously it didn't take much of an, ex an extrapolation or a vision to see that eventually it would encroach more and more and more and more. And uh, Tolkien was uh, a scholastic. He wasn't raised with the typical or educated with the typical uh, education system that most of his contemporaries were um, at, at Oxford. And most of all, uh, darn near everybody is raised with this education these days. It's a industrial education that um, doesn't do our, doesn't serve our mind well at all. Mm -hmm. Tolkien had that in his mythology too. That was Saruman. Saruman is John Dewey. John Dewey is a uh, very heavily, uh, very influenced, very much influenced our education system. He's actually from my hometown. The loss of logic and the loss of, of reason, not reason in the sense that Kant promoted it or the Enlightenment philosophers, which was reason at the expense of faith, um, uh, but Tolkien's mythology is really about the reunification of faith and reason. Aragorn, men in Tolkien's mythology are reason. Uh, Tolkien's mythology is an interior psychological mythology. Middle Earth is the material brain. A man across the sea is the immaterial intellect. Um, uh, we are a substantial unity of body and soul that cannot be separated except by death. So. <clears throat> Um, Tolkien was uh, was uh, very much aware of the coming dumbing down through the education system. Edu the education system had been weaponized uh, by the uh, by the socialists. Had been weaponized um, early on. It is weaponized today. Uh, the human mind is so programmable. We are the most programmable creatures in the world. We can program. We can be programmed to do almost anything. Um, we can be programmed to uh, assassinate somebody, you know, just like your last guest. Um, we can be programmed to be benevolent. We can pro be programmed to be malevolent. Um, the habits, which are the hobbits, by the way, the habits are the hobbits. Um, the four cardinal virtues are uh, the four main hobbits. Temperance is Frodo, fortitude is Sam, uh, justice is Mary, and Pippin is prudence. We can take those and we can use those to actually program ourselves, and that's formation. And education used to be formation. And now education isn't formation anymore. Education is just programming. And it's mm -hmm. programming us to ourselves and to not even understand whether or not we're male or female and to ultimately commit suicide by joining with machines in a process of evolution. It's a continuation of evolution. People will be convinced that, well, this is how we're supposed to evolve. We're supposed to evolve. And Joined with machines, and that was ultimately Alan Turing's uh, goal. Which Alan Turing was in the training group with with yeah. Tolkien, and Tolkien obviously had met Alan Turing. And yeah. Turing is the father of of all this. Turing fathered all this artificial intelligence. Yeah, he wrote a paper, 1950, right. Computing Machinery yeah. and Intelligence. Before we run to the break here, I want to get your comment on this. You say on page 402, this language of machine code is the language of Mordor, the black speech. Only his servants, the Nazgul, could use it. Against the most yeah. universal language of music is set this evil language of in, uh, inanimate machines. Well, it's the machine where they really applied that really well was in the, in the 17th century, 18th century loom in punch cards and whatnot. Mm. It just on and off. It's just brutal machine language. It's, just a, it's, it's, a, it's how you can run numbers linear, linearly. Uh, through a machine at the speed of light. And that wasn't happening in Tolkien's day because we hadn't really harnessed the power of electricity with transistors and whatnot. But now um, it's, it's ubiquitous and it's, got, it's eating its supply. Tolkien used these concepts just outside the back entrance into the realm of the machine, Sauron's domain, Mordor. 
And this is the essence of the event at Shelob's Lair. Shelob, the complex and deadly loom-spinning virtual tapestry of mortal sin, which trick the mind into thinking they are real and whose thick, sticky webs blocked escape from her evil and dark abode. This is essentially what the modern computer can do. To break through sin into freedom, the modern man must escape from the screen or the goggles. I don't know how deep you want to get into the mythology, but the Shelob's lair is pornography. Um, uh, Gollum is intemperance. Frodo is temperance. That's why she, uh, Gollum calls Frodo master because only temperance can master intemperance. And temperance is our ability to master ourselves, to control and particularly the desires of the flesh. Um, so Frodo is, or uh, Sam is fortitude, who has to be right there with Frodo. Good old temperance and fortitude are interior virtues. And Gollum intemperance brings them into pornography to try to trap them uh, so he can get the ring back. The ring is ones and zeros. It is the language of binary code. Um, so yeah. he wants that back so he can continue to slake himself. This is all the psychology of a single human being. We all have these uh, these aspects and facets of our mind. He brings them in there to try to trap them, and they are trapped. And the only way that the only escape, the only means that they have, they have two. They have the sword sting, which is made by the elves, and the elves are faith. And they have the file of Galadriel, and the file of Galadriel that's been accumulating the light of the Silmaril from uh, Erendil. Uh, this is all the Silmarillion. Um, they pull it out, and it fights back. Shelob and what the file is, it's, this is the beauty of Tolkien's uh, world building. Um, it, the file of Galadriel is filial fear. It's, mm. uh, it's the fear of offending God. Uh, and it's the only thing that can prevent us from being uh, 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 devoured by pornography. And pornography ruins the mind and it's, it's ruining the minds of millions, maybe billions of children um, who will have these images stuck in their mind that will be very difficult, if not impossible, to completely eradicate. And the filial fear is the only thing that we have. It's the fear of offending God. We, servile fear is not enough. Servile fear is, uh, is the fear of, of burning in hell. But against the, the, you know, the orgasm and the ecstasy of the pleasure of, of pornography, the filth is a feeling too. So it's, it's just two feelings fighting each other. And typically um, the, the servile fear loses out in the end. And um, yeah. but not with filial fear. Filial fear is the, is the fear of offending God. And we really, when we build that relationship and we build that, that love for God through our habits and changing our habits and seeking sanctity and taking advantage of the sacraments, um, that's the limbus spread. That's the cordial of the elves. It's not the sacrament themselves, but it's the effect that the sacraments and the grace that the sacraments gives to our souls, gives to our minds. To, to achieve what we need to achieve. And it's mm -hmm. that light of filial fear that drives Shelob back. And then Sam, fortitude ultimately, wielding the filial fear and the sting, the, the sword of faith drives and defeats Shelob. And that, that's what we need. Yeah. Tolkien was a master, master builder. The reason that his, mytho his mythology is so popular and it's the most popular literature in the world, and I think hands down the most important in the world, is that... It not only shows us where we've been and where we are, but also where we're going. And if we're not careful, we're going to be devoured by the beast. And I believe it is the biblical beast. AI will become the biblical beast that owns us. And only Christ will be able to defeat it. Um, but he gives us the solution. And the solution is that we have to become saints. Mm. Because ultimately the machine cannot deal with saints. Saints don't live by the probabilities and the statistics of the average human being. That's going to be absorbed by the trap. And the trap, the bait of the trap is pornography. And once yeah. you go down that rabbit hole, you're, you're, it's got you. And it's thick webs and you can't get out unless you've got filial fear and the sword of faith and fortitude and temperance. Once you destroy the mind and, you, and you've conquered someone to the point where their interior golem has completely throttled both Frodo and Sam, uh, temperance and fortitude, then you've got a, a self-enslaved human being. Um, yeah. The sexual revolution was uh, was a, a great was allowed to uh, enter uh, into our society because we've got this false idea of freedom. Um, we've allowed freedom be to become license rather than real freedom has to be joined, of course, totally with liberty. 
And liberty has responsibility. And liberty um, is what we're after. And we have the liberty to seek God. We have the liberty to work out our own salvation rather than the government's domination. Um, anytime someone uh, equates freedom with, I can do whatever I want, you're already enslaving yourself. You're enslaving yourself to your interior passions. And the government doesn't, or whoever your enemy doesn't, the devil doesn't have to lift the finger, you're already toast. Talk to me about the about the uh, co-author of the book, uh, Ali Ghaffari. I, I find him very fascinating. Uh, retired yeah. Navy F-18 pilot. That's always cool. Taught at the uh, at the academy as well. Pretty neat. How did the two of you get connected? And how did, and were you? Was he also interested I, in Tolkien? I mean, what's the deal? Uh, not not nearly as much as I am. I, the book, I wrote the book, but it wouldn't have become a material object as it is uh, without. <laughs> Ali, because Ali is just the ultimate doer. Um, I've known Ali since he was a young man uh, in his teens. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, I, I mentored him. He actually allowed me to uh, to educate him, truly educate him with a scholastic education. After he'd already he'd gone to Phillips Academy, um, thirty of his classmates went to Harvard. You know, wow. um, he uh, was going to be a brain surgeon. He was a Mensa and all this. And then one evening we had looking at the stars, and I had a couple of beers. And uh, I started talking with him, and he realized that he really didn't know anything that he was talking about, even in his biology. Um, and I had been reading Aquinas and, and Aristotle, and he never encountered anyone who was self uh, self educated, and it blew his mind, and uh, really humbled him. And he allowed me to educate him over the next few years, and then he uh, joined the Navy and became an F eighteen pilot, and then. Uh, he taught with the Naval Academy for a few years. And then uh, it, during that time, too, he started the uh, Divine Mercy Academy School in Maryland, which is the fastest uh, growing school in Maryland. It's a it's a uh, classical Catholic education, um, has nothing to do with the diocese. Um, and uh, and yeah, he's been on Fox News and uh, Crisis Magazine and EWTN. That's awesome. and, uh, nice guy. Yeah, least fairly well known. Yeah, he's. Yeah, he's a real go-getter, and I converted him uh, uh, to because he was an atheist. And, That's amazing. Uh, and yeah, and I was uh, best man at his wedding, and then also um, uh, his his uh, his sponsor for his, his confirmation. We're very close, and then I've had these. You know, I've I've been studying. I'm, I it's what I do, and I figured out the Tolkien mythology through and through. So if you really want to understand what it's really about, what Tolkien was really telling us, um, this book tells you what it's really about. And uh, it's very much outside the box because let's face it. I mean, most of the interpreters of Tolkien have been educated in the Dewey system to some degree. So they weren't looking hey. at it through a scholastic lens. Dewey uh, is a, a, a long, the, the byproduct of what really started with Francis Bacon, which was really started with the Reformation. Francis Bacon uh, poo-pooed on Aristotle, poo-pooed on the scholastics because they didn't make anything useful. He, his whole idea was we it's got to be you know practical well that's practical wisdom they did away with metaphysics and metaphysics is the is the is the, the science of being so they they emphasize the science of quantity which is mathematics and arithmetic and they emphasize the science of motion which is the science of physics and then they did away with well what are we measuring and what's moving he did away with that so uh, you know we've been stuck in this this uh very truncated education system. Tolkien actually, the, the, the dwarves are scientific knowledge, by the way. Um, so the, the mines of Moria are the halls of academia. Uh, Orthanc, the, the tower that Saruman uh, occupies, is the blackened uh, ivory tower. His, his servant, Wormtongue, is the Marxist teacher. Unmanning our practical wisdom, in this case, are the Rohirrim. They're the practical, uh, uh, practical, uh, not practical wisdom, that's sermon, but they're practical reason. So the, the whole, the whole, the whole uh, event in the minds of Moria are that comes to a head. Gandalf is is philosophical wisdom. Gray at first because he's pre-Christian. Um, he faces down the Belrog, and the Belrog is academic pride. Belrogs are the spirits of pride, and this one is in the bowels of Moria, and it's it's called Durin's bane because it's Darwin. Durin is Darwin, the great scientist. And what happens when he pulls Gandalf down in, he pulls him down into the body to show him that he's just an animal. And of course he defeats him and, and he doesn't defeat 
at philosophicalism. And when he comes back, he's Gandalf the White, and now he's a, he's a Thomistic theologian. And with fully, fully capable with metaphysics and the whole theology. And he, of course, takes, con- takes charge and ownership of the great horse, and the great fast horse is the spirit of decisiveness. So he's no longer in doubt anymore. He's no longer gray. He knows exactly what he has to do. He knows exactly where he has to go, and he goes there immediately. And Gandalf is, and of course, he's up against artificial intelligence, which is Sauron. Sauron is artificial intelligence. The eye is the scanner eye, right out of Alan Turing's 1936 paper on computable numbers with an application to the Skydex problem, where he literally invents the computer on paper. And Tolkien takes those elements and turns it into eventually uh, Sauron, who is the who is idolatry. Um, Morgoth is is not Satan. Morgoth is is mortal sin. Um, <clears throat> so it, these are all. This is so scholastic, such a Catholic uh, catechism. So when they go through the Mines of Moria, what they're doing is they're undoing the John Dewey education that they had received, um, and he has to defeat the bell the the Belrog, the spirit of academic pride, which is there to take his faith, because this Belrog has a sword. No other Belrog has a sword. And that sword is to counter the sword that Gandalf has, which is Glamdring, which is a sword made by the elves, the foe hammer. But he, he doesn't defeat him, and, he, and Gandalf comes back, Gandalf the White. But he can't defeat the machine because the machine is embedded in the cerebellum, the, and it's, it is the microchip. Okay, the whole, the whole Middle Earth is laid out in, in according to a, 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 a diagram of phrenology, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with phren- phrenology, but it is the Victorian pseudoscience of certain parts of your head and certain areas of your brain are responsible for certain things. And for instance, where the Shire is, is where it actually is, that's where the habits are. Those are where, um, where we, the, the virtues are. Where Mordor is, is the cerebellum. And according to the, the, the phrenology, that's the area of crime and hate and, and deceit and all those things. So uh, it's all laid out in the book. I mean, I could get, is it, but I'm a very, very big critic of modern education. In fact, we've just produced a documentary with uh, my co-author and uh, Miles Vasilius, who was uh, John Henry Weston's videographer for a year or so. Um, we've mm. actually produced, now it's in, it's, in the, it's in the process of being edited right now. It's called The Great Indoctrination. And that we really explore the, the roots of education, which is, let's face it, it's the Catholic Church. And then where it fell and how it, it got all tangled up with, with the socialist ideology and communism and where we are today, which is just an absolute travesty. We're murdering children's minds. And then oh, the yeah. solution, of course, we have to return to the Catholic Church. No, I think anytime we say that it's too late, we, 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 we put aside the grace of God. We put aside providence. We, put aside, we can't put aside hope. And we can't put aside, it does look pretty hopeless. Um, you know, when you see the, the, the ubiquitous nature of, of AI and pornography um, and the lack of critical thought in our young people, um, young people who are otherwise very capable and have, may have a very high, even very high IQ, but they have such a, a degenerate education. It's an industrial education. Um, it's an education not to form them as saints, but to form them as demons. Um, and, and confuse them to the point where, I mean, 15 years ago, nobody would have believed you if you said the kids won't, you know, they'll be able to choose what they want to be, you know, male or female or even right. a cat, yeah. you know, or any of this. Stuff. You just, you'd laugh, you'd have laughed. But when you talk to these college kids and they may have a degree, by the way, the white hand of Saruman, that is the diploma. That's the diploma. That's the white hand of Saruman. Okay. And, mm. uh, you know, they, that academia has a very firm hold. Academia has been terribly, terribly corrupted. Not all of them. Now, there are still some good universities. Um, most of them are faith-based. Um, most of them are Catholic. Um, but even many of the formerly staunch Catholic, uh, you know, Notre Dame or, 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 or uh, uh, you know, any of the Catholic universities that you would assume are Catholic, they've been, they've been utterly corrupted, too. And uh, it's all this DEI and all this stuff is just is oh, terrible. Yeah. And it's a terrible, oh, yeah. terrible, terrible, destructive uh, wound injury against our young people. I'm not sure getting TikTok 
news these days is any worse than getting news from MSNBC or CNN what? or any of these other players. mainstream. It, yeah, it is. It's just all deception. It's all manipulation and it's all programming. And these poor kids, they, they don't, they, you have, none of them have any awareness of even the three basic rules of logic, non-contradiction, excluded middle, and a law of identity. They don't even know what you're talking about. They have no idea. And if they take a philosophy course, they come out 13 times more confused than they were when they went in. Because they'll yeah. never study Aristotle except for a little snippet here and there to say they did. And then they're lost in the, you know, the, 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 the chaos. Of, uh, one of the things I do in my book just as a side in the footnotes, I refute uh, Russell, uh, uh, Bertrand Russell's very famous uh, Barber's Paradox that the mathematicians always set out as, oh, you know, Russell found a, Bertrand Russell found a, a glitch, you know, a paradox in mathematics. Well, he didn't. All he did, it was faulty logic. He gave the barber two essences. He gave him the essence of a barber, an essence of self, and then he allowed those two essences to contradict each other. And that's just false logic. And it's fooled the whole world now for, what, 110 some odd years. And really, it, it, when you, you know, and I explain it, it's just ridiculous. But that's how far our thought process has fallen. And even these very bright people, even famous mathematicians like Frigg and Russell and, and whatnot, when, he pres when, when Russell presented this Barber's Paradox type thing to Frigg, he went in the mental institution for 20 years because it seemed to undermine... Uh, all of his work and all Freed really had to do was say, well, you dummy, you're, you're given the barber. Barber isn't, barberness is a, is an accidental attribute. It's not an essence. Self mm -hmm. is essence. He can never, he can't be, he can't be other than himself, but he might quit and not be the barber and be the accountant or the taxi driver tomorrow. So that's an accidental attribute, but Russell treated it as two essential attributes and then allowed them, of course, in that false logic, allowed them to create what looked like a dichotomy, what looked like mm. a paradox. And it's not, it's just false logic. And that's, the, that's typical of the academic mind. Of course, I've realized that since the Reformation, almost nobody's really studied Aristotle. They just really haven't. They, most of, their, of our prelates, have, they've been educated in the same system, the same broken, uh, darkened, uh, infested, socialist infected uh, system of education. And um, they suffer the same programming, so you can't expect them to know any better. You know, our, our, our bishops and, and, and cardinals and, and priests and whatnot, for the most part, uh, have been very, very poorly educated. Did you like that video? It's okay. You can admit it. It's perfectly fine. Hey, we cover the big stories of our day, from inside the church to outside the church to all points in between, and we do it from a Catholic perspective. It's called a Catholic Take. It's a radio program Monday through Friday. We live stream it right here on this channel, by the way, so make sure to subscribe, like, and share. We would be very grateful to you. And don't forget, you're going to want to watch this video right here because you don't want to miss anything.